only the pure gravity experts, a few of them have figured this out, where Einstein had this attempted unified field theory. It turned out to not quite have electromagnetism, but was actually a good theory of gravity. And nobody seems to be paying attention to that. Well, until maybe 10 years ago, it's been starting to explore more. Well, it, it got explored in the 70s a bit, and then it kind of died down. Mm -hmm. And then another version of... Um, so that used torsion. Einstein used torsion. So what is torsion? It's the torquing of space-time itself. The torquing of space-time. So general relativity has uh, energy and momentum that sources gravitation, which is curvature. So like a sphere is curved, mm -hmm. but it's not twisted, right? Right. So Elie Carton, a mathematician, eventually invented... He was studying physics theories as a mathematician and realized, wait a second, from the old mathematics from the 1800s, there should be something to twist space-time as well. He introduced this uh, space-time torsion. And then this, this other guy, Weil, introduced nonmetricity, which is even more exotic. That's even crazier than torsion. But it's like torsion is already so crazy that no one even hears about nonmetricity because that's even more out there. And so these, these are the types of non-Riemannian geometry that Eric Weinstein was talking about. And you can see in his theory, he actually kind of is inspired by trying to make sense of some of those things. But I don't think he fully has studied all of the work that has come out in the past 30 years, which helps clarify much quickly how to get into exploring this, these topics. Okay, is this, an, this is an example of what torsion looks like? Yeah, I mean, torsion is, is somewhat of a general term as well, so it gets used yeah. in other applications as well. So that's why I like to use the term space-time torsion, just to mm -hmm. point out. But yeah, exactly. Space-time right? torsion. So you can imagine imagine that rod or bar was space-time uh -huh. in some sense. And so the idea was that maybe spin should source torsion. That was the idea, right? Like if you have matter that's rotating, mm -hmm. shouldn't it sort of drag or twist space-time with it in some way? That was That was... Carton's motivation mm. and it, it he wasn't even interested in quantum mechanics he was just interested in spin angular momentum you know planets can spin but it mm. turns out that quantum theory really a big part of it is about quantum spin and so it turns out that that quantum spin is needed to source torsion so the electron it, it's it's just kind of a fact if you want to go into how to look into studying the electron in curved space-time and do it in the standard way, it requires torsion, but nobody likes to admit that in academia for the most part. And so all of the, no one is just trying to study <coughs> quantizing that theory with torsion called Einstein-Carton theory. Mm -hmm. I, I've looked, I've done the research because I wanted to do this myself in yeah. graduate school. I, I realized that this should be computed to see if it's a good, if it's how it does for quantum gravity, it's it's the most reasonable thing to do. It's the most conservative thing to do. It makes mathematically, if you forget all of the stigma of human culture yeah. and you just look at the math, it's obvious that this is the thing to try. But my advisor didn't let me work on it. He he thought it was too risky. How would you try it? It it would involve calculations. So this would be trying to calculate the scattering of electrons with gravitons, the force carrier of gravity, and trying to see... So the problem with... Isn't gravity waves? Gravitational waves, yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. So gra gravitons are the particle aspect of gravitational waves. Ah, got and it. And so some people <clears throat> get tripped up on this and they say, oh, well, we know gravitational waves exist, but gravitons... That's, we've never measured that. That's crazy, right? Okay. But if you think about light, light is an electromagnetic wave, but it's also a particle, the photon. Really, there's the photon field that has particle-like and wave-like aspects. Ah, and so, so kind of both. I, I, I will admit that I'm coming at this from a quantum field theory perspective. Okay. And I'm saying that if you just think about what the photon is and you think about gravity... This, this is the interpretation. I mean, the gravitational field is, uh, it, it contains gravitons and gravitational waves, just as the photon field can contain photons as particles and electromagnetic waves. Okay. So it's really not that 
ridiculous to imagine gravitons. And I actually, in my thesis, I computed how to use Feynman diagrams, which are these diagrams that get used in quantum field theory, but I use them to calculate general relativity results. And so this is kind of a thing that physicists are figuring out how to do better and better. They're actually figuring out how to use the, the mathematics developed for the Large Hadron Collider, which is colliding protons. And we, we kind of spent all our money. You know, we, we, we put it up as high energy as we can. We got all the tax dollars we could, and we found everything we could. We found exactly what we <laughs> thought we would find. And now we're moving on to LIGO, which is this gravitational wave detector. Now we're, instead of- colliding, LIGO? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the world's largest gravitational wave detector. They actually have two or three different locations around the globe. And they get signals from from this this from that outer outer space, and they they correlate the signals across the entire Earth to to identify. Um, they triangulate the single signal to figure out if if because the 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 experiments are so sensitive that if you have an earthquake nearby in one of these experiments, it sets off the detectors, or oh, even just I like a car driving this. by. So they have to they have to set Is up. This it? Yeah, that's that's one of the detectors. So. It's set up with that geometry to pick up on uh, polarization, basically the spin of the graviton or the, the polarization of the gravitational waves is related to the design of this experiment itself. That's why it has that L shape. And so that's a, an interferometer. And so they're bouncing light around on mirrors and the, the mirrors are sensitive down to 10 to the minus 18 meters, which is some of the most sensitive measurements in the world. So if those mirrors move by the tiniest fraction of a fraction of a fraction of an inch, it sets off a signal. So this looks like two giant chopsticks crossing each other with mirrors inside them that are bouncing light beams exactly. into the center. So what happens is you, you send out, you have a laser and the laser goes through a beam splitter. So you have the same type <clears throat> of light getting split going down two directions and it's bouncing off the end and coming back. And so the, the two lengths, the two arms are exactly the same length. Uh -huh. And so it's trying to measure, do the photons come back at exactly the same time? Or is there a gravitational wave that came through and messed it up? So if they're coming in, they're, they're going out into the two arms at the same time and coming back. If there's no gravitational waves, they're going to come back, reflect off the end. Four and kilometer come back length. At the same exact time. And so the detector is, so you see how the detector is kind of, flanking the laser, right? Because after it bounces off the test mass at the end of the, the arm, it comes back and it, and it gets merged together and goes into the detector to see if the two photons uh, came back at the same time or if there was a slight time delay. If there's a time delay, then they're, they're implying that there must have been some space-time curvature that, that caused length to get deformed, so it actually had to travel a larger distance on one of the arms than the other.